Hello there, my friends. This week is special upload on Tuesday, as you can see. Next one is still coming on Friday, still narrated by me. But this one this week is narrated by a friend of mine who is helping out a little bit. We may have new videos up every Tuesday and Friday from here on out. Let's see where this goes. Hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned and see you on Friday. The movie is The Sadness, which really should have been named The Grossness, it takes place in Taipei, Taiwan. The city succumbs to a viral pandemic that transforms peaceful citizens into sadistic, bloodthirsty maniacs. In this video, we will look at the mistakes the characters make, figure out potential alternatives, and attempt to beat the mysterious illness presented in the movie The Sadness. Our main characters are a young couple named Kat and Jim. They seem comfortable with each other and have the kind of familiarity that indicates they've been together a long time. Jim begs Kat to take the morning off and stay in bed with him, but she tells him that she has an important work meeting that she can't miss, effectively ending Jim's hope of morning s Jim grabs his phone and watches a news report, and this is the first time we hear of the deadly Alvin virus. Similar to our real-world COVID-19 virus, symptoms present as flu-like, and experts are waiting for the disease to violently mutate, which will lead to the demise of civilization as they know it. Not much is known about the virus, other than the fact that it's highly contagious, and no one is really taking it seriously outside the medical community. The political officials of Taipei are accused of sweeping it under the rug because it's an election year, and the common people of the city assume it's just another bullshit scare tactic designed to keep them in line since there's no confirmed deaths. I don't know about you guys, but I just stay home. Maybe COVID's been around for too long and I'm used to being quarantined, but why risk it, right? Easier to call in sick and be safe rather than sorry. From the balcony, Jim watches as an elderly woman a few rooftops away. She stares blankly into nothing before turning around and revealing a mass of blood. Cat comes up behind Jim and startles him. By the time he looks back, the woman is gone. Just another sign they should have stayed in bed and called it quits for the day. Mr. Lin walks onto his balcony and says hello. Jim notices that Mr. Lin is obviously sick. Lin dismisses the hospitals and says the illness will pass in a few days because it's just a cold. Turns out, Lin has his own conspiracies regarding the Alvin virus and says it's just a hoax to lower stock market and housing prices so that the rich can buy low and sell it at inflated value later when the supposed virus has run its course. Now our characters leave on Jim's motorcycle, where he drives her to the subway. On the way there, there's an accident on the side of the road involving several officers. They can't see much, but there's one body that is exceptionally bloody. It's not Halloween, is it? Jim drives back toward home. The scene with the officers and the body now non-existent and only the cop car is left behind. Instead of going directly home after seeing something weird and unexplained like that, Jim decides to go to a fast food restaurant like an idiot. Honestly, if he'd just gone home, the entire rest of the movie might have been avoided. But movies got a movie, so of course, Jim doesn't go home. Because that would have been too smart. The same bloody old lady from the rooftop walks in, and she looks like shit. Red puffy eyes, oozing some kind of pus, and disgusting ass teeth. Now for our first dead body. She promptly attacks a man, and we're off to the races, folks. She then turns, grabs the oil fryer, and dumps it on the cook's head, melting his skin like paper. Talk about 100% customer satisfaction. Jim finally realizes he should get the f out of there and runs outside. The woman follows him, nearly catching him, when a car comes out of nowhere and hits her. The driver starts laughing maniacally, covered in blood, and laughs. That b came out of nowhere, he says. Instead of getting on his bike and riding away, which would have been the smart thing to do, he runs away on foot, again. Why not take the bike? Unless you're Usain Bolt, do you really think you can outrun the living dead successfully? He's chased by another deranged infected and runs into a small alleyway with a door. The zombie bats at him, reaching inside, but Jim ducks and runs away. He makes it back to his apartment and bursts in the door. He tries to call Cat, but gets no response. On the TV, nothing is on except a disturbing cartoon and a civil emergency national warning sign on every channel. 
A loudspeaker goes off, and though at first this sounds like the army might be coming in to contain the infected and rescue the survivors, there's no such luck. The voice on the speaker tells everyone to come outside so they can do, well, let's just say, some rather unpleasant stuff. Without warning, Lin attacks Jim with his gardening clippers. Jim holds the insides of the blades, keeping Lin away, but the blades inch towards Jim's neck all the same. Jim falters, and two of Jim's fingers suffer decapitation. Lin picks up one of the fingers and chews on it. After he gets the finger nice and chewed up, he tosses it into the fish tank. Mmm, finger food. No? Two on the nose? I'll show myself out. Jim hits Lin in the head with the toaster. He jumps over Lin's body and makes his way to the exit. Lin wakes up, but Jim escapes just in time. This is stupid, right? What he should have done was make sure that Lin was truly dead. At the very least, he could have taken the body and dumped it outside of the apartment or thrown it over the railing and bolt locked the door. Instead, he runs outside where the world has gone to sh**. Jim sees groups of people eating each other and doing unspeakable things to one another, all laughing and giddy. This is one party you don't want to be invited to. Jim goes to his bike, very quietly trying to turn on the engine with his one working hand. The noise attracts a group of zombies, but he's able to zoom away before sustaining any more damage. It's here that the movie decides to switch over to Kat's perspective for the majority of the film. She is quietly reading a novel on the train when the businessman next to her says hello. After numerous attempts at small talk, Kat shuts him down, saying that she just wants to read her book. The businessman mutters under his breath that Kat's being a bitch. Uncomfortable, Kat stands and tells an oncoming passenger to take her seat. Now, this part is important. Remember this guy. He becomes a real mother here in a second. Suddenly, a passenger pulls out a knife and stabs the guy next to him. Blood splurts all over, and it takes another five men to tackle the stabber. The woman who took Kat's spot, later we learn that her name is Amy, is mortified, and Kat tries to comfort her saying that it's over and they got him. But this is, of course, a zombie move, so it's not really over. A man stabs a woman, making multiple incisions. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that they are literally bathed in blood. Businessman gorges Amy in the eye with the point of an umbrella. Cat helps Amy out of the car, and the businessman stares up at them, intent on raping them. The girls disappear into a small subway tunnel, still chased by the businessman. They meet another bystander who tries to help them, but ultimately succumbs to the disease via the businessman, who bites off his nose for a quick snack. There's a real rhinoplasty nose joke in there somewhere, I'm sure, but let's move on. While this is, of course, terrifying, I don't understand why the girls don't fight back. I mean, there's two of them, and only one of him, right? What they should have done is run around the corner and waited for him to appear. Then they could have taken him down together. But they don't do that, because again, too easy. They make their escape, seeing a figure at the end of the tunnel. They pull an Indiana Jones and slide underneath the door and out to safety in the nick of time. Back to Fingerless Jim for a second. Via convenient broadcast exposition, we learn a little more insight into the effects of the virus, which activates the sexual part of the brain. Many Many people are being raped and sadistically molested by the infected. No thanks. He stops at the shoulder and checks his wound. The first time we see it clearly, his middle and ring finger are missing, and it's enough to make anyone lose their lunch. Although he's going to be rocking a pretty sick hand horns from now on. He hears crying and goes to investigate. A lone survivor is being beaten and tortured by three infected men who beat him over the head continually. They grab barbed wire, tying it to a pole. They pick the man up and use him like a battering ram, running him into the barbed pole at full speed. Genitals first. Crushed nuts, anyone? Jim eventually intervenes and scares them away. The survivor sits up and reams Jim. Why did you stop them? He asks. I was just about to blow my load. Ew. The infected come back and chase Jim off and rides away as fast as he can. Cat and Molly make it to a hospital full of other injured survivors. Cat begs for them to help Molly, but the officer says that the ER is closed. A nurse comes up and inspects the hole in Molly's eye socket, making an exception for her. A subway worker complains about his nose, saying, What about me? The nurse shines the light on his nose. It's not broken. You're fine. Add joke about the American healthcare system here. Cat asks to borrow a phone since hers was left on the train. A broadcast comes up on TV. A military general says there's no evidence 
evidence that it's a biological attack of any kind, and that the military is working to resolve things as quickly as possible. He introduces the president, who steps up to the podium and tells them that the Taiwanese people are strong and that they will prevail over the virus together. A fight breaks out, and Kat dips into the corner out of harm's way while the officer calms everybody down. From where Kat sits, she can see the businessman approaching the glass doors behind the officer. Now, the smart thing to do would have been to yell out and alert the security guard. But Kat doesn't do that. Instead, she does nothing and loses the safety of the hospital and gets the man with the gun killed. She could have used that gun to protect herself, even if just for a little while. In search of Kat, the businessman finds Molly, stuck underneath a neck brace and confined to a wheelchair, and unzips his pants. He f Molly's eye hole as she cries and screams in pain. I think I'd rather just die. Back to Jim. They're finally able to make a call, and Kat says that because she's using someone else's phone, she can only receive calls, not make them. He tells her to put the ringer on silent so that the noise won't attract any zombies. Maybe these two aren't so dumb after all. Jim sees a mannequin head lying in the muck and has a fantasy of a disembodied woman's head, her tongue sticking out completely black and flickering back and forth. Still in the hospital, Kat sneaks down the stairs in a red-lit hallway, quietly passing through one of the doors. Carnage still reigns in the rest of the hospital. There are orgies and r and demented sadistic s Molly has since become infected and chows down on a disassembled corpse. A bone saw lays next to her, and Molly turns around, grinning, and uses the bone saw to cut down another unsuspecting victim. The businessman jumps out and attacks Cat in the hallway. I'm not gonna stop until I f you to death. And they say chivalry is dead. Cat makes a pretty smart move here. Using the end of a fire extinguisher, she bashes his head in. She doesn't stop until she knows he's dead for sure. Finally, Cat seems to be getting a hang of things in this brave new world. A man in a hazmat suit appears, points a gun at her, and tells her to follow him. This may or may not be a good idea, but like I said, he's in a hazmat suit and seems to appear normal. She follows him into the maternity ward, where he instructs her to handcuff herself to the shower. He turns on the shower, which he tells her is a medical and chemical compound. And also, it might not work, but it's worth a shot. He says she might be immune since she hasn't started exhibiting any symptoms, and that he'll take a blood sample from her, and with it, he may be able to make a vaccine. This guy seems to have the right idea, even though we don't really know his motives. At least he's planning ahead and trying to make a vaccine. The sooner there's a vaccine, the sooner it'll all be over, right? He fills her in more with the Alvin virus. While the virus leaves the brain fully intact, the infected must inflict pain and suffering on their victims in order to be satisfied. The Alvin virus affects both the sexual and the sadistic sides of the brain and affects the brain's ability to regulate aggression. As he's explaining, Kat grabs her bloody clothes and tosses them into a dumpster, but something moves underneath it. She goes to inspect it, and it's a live baby, infected by the virus. The doctor sneaks up behind her and injects her with infected blood. Kat falls to the ground. He handcuffs her back to the shower and then suffocates the baby. He tries to justify his actions to her, saying that when he got to the hospital, all the babies were abandoned, so he was going to kill them all and save them from the same fate the rest of the survivors endured. Then he tried to use them as a way to develop a vaccine, but they were all infected. He then killed them and apparently missed one. Cat hides the phone, texting Jim her location. This one's tricky. Cat could break her thumb and slip through the handcuffs. We know she's decently strong because she's already killed the businessman, so it's not too far out to say that she could overpower this doctor. She's in a hospital, so she could easily barricade herself in somewhere. The hospital has everything you need in case of an emergency, and it's likely that there's food and vending machines nearby, along with plenty of bed, blankets, and pillows to use while waiting for the zombies to kill each other off. The doctor holds a gun to her head and leads her out into the hall where he's attacked by an infected man with an axe who hacks at the doctor's foot. The doctor shoots the man and screams at Cat to help him up. He tells her, as he's already called for a rescue team, and Cat is a viable source for a vaccine. She helps him up and they round the corner when Jim finds them. Only, it's not Jim anymore. Jim has been infected by the virus, and the doctor succumbs shortly after. Cat escapes them both, hiding behind a thick wall of metal bars. Jim drags himself over to her, smiling at her, because he loves her and wants to peel the skin off of her slowly. She asks him what it feels like, and he says, wonderful. Cat finds the exit to the roof at the top of the short staircase. The open door illuminates her and fills the hallway with light as she emerges onto the rooftop. Whether Cat makes it or is infected by the rescue team, 
We don't know. The movie decides to be a jerk and not tell us. Maybe there will be the sadness too that reveals Kat's fate. I like to think that she made it out and that her blood was used to create a vaccine that ended the pandemic. Gosh, can you imagine how scary it would be to live in a world where a global pandemic could alter our lives forever? What would you have done if you were in Kat's shoes? Would you have quarantined yourself in, tried to look for a cure, or gone full badass zombie killer? Let me know. And as always, take care of yourselves. I'll see you again next week. Peace out and binge another one.